he wanted to feel like a god. She liked the vampirism. She liked the blood. They found him very romantic and very enthralling. If you wanted to drink, do drugs, go ahead. If you wanted to have sex, go ahead. As a charismatic leader, Rod had a gift. Sadly, it was just a deadly gift. Three days before Thanksgiving in Eustis, Florida, 17-year-old Jennifer Wendorf returns home late after a night out. Jennifer comes home about 10.30. She sees her dad's feet on the couch. She thinks the dad just fallen asleep on the couch. She's supposed to be home by 10.15. So if she's late, she's breaking curfew. So she goes in to use the phone and call her boyfriend. But she notices the phone jerked out of the wall. Mom? So she comes back to the kitchen. <gasps> then she sees her mother covered in blood. So she runs to her dad. <laughs> And she's screaming. She sees her dad in a pool of blood. Then she realizes her dad is dead too. Jennifer finds a phone that's working and calls 911. My, my, parents, my parents are dead. My parents, my parents are dead. The house is just awful. There's blood everywhere. Now, the first officer on the scene looks at the dad and says his face looked like hamburger. This is not an ordinary crime. One of the first things they do is, of course, they talk to Jennifer. And she says, a car is missing, and my sister is missing. Right away, they're saying, well, is she a kidnap victim? Was she a participant in this awful crime? What's going on here? Two dead bodies, a stolen car, and a missing teen. Police are baffled. Crimes like this don't happen in Eustis, Florida. Eustis was kind of the quintessential small town America. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody's kids. He enjoyed the, the feel that you didn't have to, to lock the doors. You didn't think about crime. The Windors seemed to be a very normal family. The mom volunteered at the school. Uh, the dad had a good job. Jennifer was uh, uh, a cheerleader and, uh, and very popular in the school. In contrast, her 14-year-old sister, Heather, is moody and rebellious. Heather was much more introspective, much more into the arts. She wasn't a cheerleader. She wanted to be her own person. It isn't just her attitude that upsets Mr. and Mrs. Wendorf. It's the company their daughter is keeping. 15-year-old Rod Farrell is the town rebel. Rod Farrell was, you know, the consummate bad boy. If you were looking to worry your parents a little bit, I mean, that would be the guy that you brought home. He was smart, he was um, fascinating to listen to, and he was very, very good at being superior in a sense. He was very charismatic. It's not only the way Rod looks and his odd behavior. There are also disturbing rumors flying around town. We're hearing about vampires. Rod and his friends were um, they were sharing blood. He did tell them that he was a 500-year-old vampire. They would cut themselves and drink blood and profess themselves as vampires. You know, at that time, you had Brad Pitt doing vampire movies. That was something that was very charismatic, and a lot of people got involved in it. 
Heather met Rod, and the two became good friends. Here's this guy talking all this stuff about fantasy and vampires and living forever. That was very fascinating for Heather. We began to explore the darker aspects, vampirism, witchcraft, uh, different aspects of the occult. Mainly the vampirism is what drew us in. It was, uh, I guess, the sensuality of it. Their relationship is intense, though not sexual. Heather is attracted to Rod's dark side. Here's a girl at that age where, like many teenagers, not happy at home, not happy with the rules uh, that mom and dad might have, maybe a little bit jealous of the attention that's paid to her sister. So them getting together, this is a way to get your parents' goat. She wasn't a girlfriend. My role in the relationship with Heather was guide, a uh, person to introduce her to a world that she sought to be part of, but she didn't quite understand at that time. Rod was creating this family, a vampire family, he called it her coven. The vampire's always been a very sensual character, seducing its victims, hunting by night, tragic love. There's always been the romance to it. There's always been the dark allure. These young people had a very depressing life in reality. And so the excitement and the imaginative world that Rod provided to them was very exciting. At that time, I was a practitioner of witchcraft. I'd also practiced demonology. I'd taken Visago as my patron demon at that time. He being one of the nine crown princes of hell and having legions under him. In demonology, taking a patron demon, you basically, literally the same way Catholics would take a patron saint. Heather's fascination with Rod intensifies. She wants to become a part of his vampire family. They went into Rod's bedroom. He'd set up an altar, and there were skulls on it, and all this witchcraft books. To bring Heather into the vampiric way of life, she willingly offered her blood to me. When you do an embrace, you are perceived to be the child of the person that performed the ritual on you. So by doing the ritual with Heather, it made her a daughter to me, a blood daughter. She, she nearly passed out that night from how much blood I had taken from her. Rod's mother is suspicious about what Rod and Heather are getting up to. They were cutting, and they were drinking blood. And so I totally freaked out. What the hell do you think you're doing? The cuts were so deep. He was bleeding very profusely. I screamed at him and told him, get out of my house. Blood was rushing down his arm. It was very frightening. He just went well, kind of crazy with it. Things got really out of hand at that time. Sandra vows she will find a way to save her son. In small town Eustace, Rod Farrell is drawing 14-year-old Heather Wendorf deeper into his dark vampiric world. Heather, she's withdrawn. She's uh, depressed. Um, she's doing some self-mutilations and drinking blood. I don't know how it went beyond just kind of a passing fancy to something that really kind of controlled her life. Fearful that Rod is spiraling out of control, 
His mom, Sandra, decides they should leave Florida and head back to her hometown 800 miles away. My mother's side of the family all live in Murray, Kentucky, and we decided to go back and um, that it would benefit everybody to go back to Kentucky. Rod was furious. He didn't want to leave his friends in Eustis. This was a disrupting to his lifestyle. Rod is upset, but Heather is devastated that he's leaving town. She's obsessed with him. Heather was saying, I, you can't imagine how, how I felt so close to Rod, how his life was all around me. Sandra takes her wayward son back to her family home. Murray, Kentucky, um, it is a small town. And uh, if it wasn't for the university, it would pretty much be like Eustis. Murray, Kentucky has always been a very rural, rustic type of environment. It's home to the Boy Scout Museum, church steeples everywhere. It was such that it was almost like a black hole that would suck people into it. But Murray, Kentucky is also a college town. So I understood there was also a scene underneath this homey, rustic type of facade. The scene that Rod is seeking is other vampires, and he soon discovers a rival cult in town. The cult is led by a, a guy named Jaden. That's his vampire name. His real name is Stephen Murphy. Jaden Murphy saw himself as a vampire sire. I love the darkness. I've always had a kinship to the night. I crave blood. I drink it. I am a vampire. I had been told that Stephen Murphy was in charge of the vampires. Lots of people had constantly tried to get us to clash and fight, saying that Rod's a vampire. And that's why he'd sought me out originally. Stephen wanted to know if he had competition in town. We met outside of Murray. He was very much similar to myself. Reclusive, you know, wore the black trench coat, thought that most people around us were just mindless cattle. We clicked instantly. Stephen tried to take me under his wing. He saw that I was very much dedicated to living this lifestyle. I told him basically what I was and what I was about and offered that to him if he would be willing to join my house and follow the laws. And uh, he accepted, and we cut one another and fed from one another. There is something in blood. It's what gives us life and keeps us alive. And it can cause you to spiral out of control. I've seen it happen a few times with people. Bloodletting is very addictive. Jaden truly believed that I was under his thumb, which I found amusing. It worked for my purposes at that time. Back in Eustis, Florida, Heather talks daily with Rod over the phone. Heather had maintained communications with Rod, and they used to talk on the phone for hours and hours and hours. We obtained phone records that showed conversations um, that would last nine, 10 hours at a time. The 800-mile separation doesn't diminish Rod's control over Heather. Rod called so many times to her that we lost our phone. I couldn't even pay the bill. It was over $1,000 for one month. She wished Rod would come back, and she would complain about how she hated her home. She hates her home. She hates her parents. She tells Rod that she wishes they were dead. Heather missed Rod. And Rod would uh, promise sometimes to come down to Florida and get her. They were just going to escape from the humdrum of parents telling you you have to clean your room, you have no money, life is, is rough, you can't find work. They were just going to take a, a break. while Heather languishes hundreds of miles away in Eustis, Florida. 
Back in Kentucky, Rod tires of Jaden and his group and sets up his own vampire coven. Rod started to get, I guess, power hungry. Rod was gathering his own followers. He didn't like Jaden being boss. With his own group, he had a lot more control and a lot more freedom to do whatever he wanted to do. I was in a maelstorm of my own madness. A lot of the kids, they're drawn to the occult because they're kind of loners. Their outlandish behavior is sort of supported. They couldn't find where they belonged, so I made a place for them to belong. If you wanted to drink, do drugs, go ahead. You wanted to have sex, orgies, go ahead. You wanted to worship any dark deity or practice any type of outlandish occultic beliefs, you could. He was taking marijuana and acid, dropping acid, uh, was becoming more enwrapped, raptured with the fantasy world. It was escalating. He was uh, trying more drugs, ecstasy, cocaine, barbiturates, just experimenting with all of it. They were doing drugs, they were partying, they were having a lot of different you know, things going on, which no child should be involved in to begin with. Many people believed that I was attempting to open the gates of hell at that time. Ron isn't just drinking his followers' blood. He's having sex with a lot of the girls. One in particular grabs his attention. Charity Cassie began dating Ron, so that was a boyfriend-girlfriend situation. They went from zero to 60 pretty fast. They were involved in a sexual relationship. Charity's diary, on the front it's like a, a little kid's diary, you know, with a picture of a little pony and all that sort of thing. But inside she talks about sucking blood and how, how great blood tastes. Well, for those who practice vampirism, the blood is like an aphrodisiac to them. As we grew closer, I allowed her to know more of what I was doing, and she seemed to take to it. She seemed to embrace the concept of it. She liked the vampirism. She liked the blood. the mindless automaton follower, that's what he was looking for. He decided to branch out and find his own people, hence bringing in Scott and Dana. Scott and Dana are both loners, ideal prey for the charismatic Rod Farrell. For somebody like Scott Anderson, who really never had friends, uh, was the outcast at school, this was the first time that Scott Anderson had an identity, was treated as somebody. There was another girl, her name was Dana. She was like 19 years old at the time. She was older, and she was sort of overweight, and she had no friends. And all of a sudden, she joins with Rod's little group, and she's got friends, she's got people coming over, and looking after her, and so on. Although he wasn't the smartest person in the room, he let people think he was, and, and he was a talker. I don't think it was an accident that he ended up drawing people in that were probably of a lesser intellect than him. As a charismatic leader, almost cult-like, Rod had a gift. I began to experiment with drugs more. I began to become more physically aggressive. There was an incident with Charity at school, which is really disturbing. He said to the teacher, I could slit your throat. He, um, he got in trouble, big trouble. He got expelled from school. So I had nothing but time on my hands. I had no restrictions. Rod and Jaden are on a collision course. He had heard that I was going to assault his mate at that time, a uh, girlfriend. Rod told Jaden's girlfriend, I'd like to, you know, basically gut you and spread your guts all over the house. 
put your head on a, on a bedpost so that when Jaden comes home, he'll find you like that. And of course, that just infuriated Jaden. He grabbed me by the throat, slammed me into the wall. If it happened like this again, I'll kill you. I picked up a baseball bat and I slammed it through the door. He started becoming more obsessed with violence and killing. I believe that I had bloodlust at that time. He wanted that surge of dominance over other living creatures. He wanted to feel like a god. For the most part, Rod's strange antics stay under the authorities' radar. All that changes when a heinous crime is committed at a local animal shelter. Somebody broke into an animal shelter and injured and mutilated a bunch of dogs. <laughs> Tore their legs off and did all this horrific stuff. And then you could see in the high grass that they had made some kind of ceremony. Police suspect Rod Farrell and his vampire followers. The authorities are coming down on him now, so now the pressure's on. Rod was feeling like he needed to get out of town. He needed to, to leave Murray. Before leaving, he calls his friend and disciple back in Florida, Heather Wendorf. They talked about their shared uh, vision of the vampire world, and having this vampire family, and how they were all going to go off somewhere. Heather was saying she was in trouble. She was like the, her parents were hurting her. Of course, they weren't doing anything physically to her. She was just feeling confined and rebellious. Rod devises an exciting plan. He'll drive down to Florida and pick her up, and together they'll head to New Orleans. Rod was trying to save the damsel in distress. He decides to take his three most loyal followers with him, including girlfriend Charity. He loads Scott's little car with Charity, with Scott, and Dana Cooper, and they all come down to Florida. Rod's pronouncements become increasingly apocalyptic and sinister. He's got this pent-up rage. He starts talking about how he's got to kill the Windorfs. You see what I'm capable of. He was very much looking for that ultimate rush. Rod thought that you can't really get more powerful than ending a human existence. Wanting to save Heather, wanting to be omnipotent, the drugs. <laughs> All those things played a part in his mind. It was totally bizarre. It was insane. Rod's clan arrives in Eustis, Florida, where he has arranged to meet Heather after a 12-month separation. Rod meets Heather over by the cemetery. And there is a cutting ritual that goes on between Rod and Heather. And they decide to meet up later at her house. The plan is, Heather will grab some clothes and run off with Rod and his vampire family. Hi. Hey, uh. Hi, Annie. How you doing? Good. Heather spends a few minutes to watch the TV with her parents. Then she gathers her things and slips out the door. But first, she leaves a little note. Dear Mom, Dad, and Jenny, I don't have much time, but I must say that I love you all very much. 
I'm leaving for good, but I don't want you to worry about me because I will be fine. Please don't try and find us. Just know that I'll miss you and will always love you. Heather. Rod has arranged to meet Heather quarter of a mile from her house. In her haste, Heather forgets to pack everything she needs for the trip. There was some memento that Heather had left behind she wanted me to look for. The decisions made that, that Rod go back to the house. Okay. I can go back for you. And then Rod says to her, says, you said to me so many times, you want your parents dead. Do you want me to, you know, kill your parents? She says, no. Don't go anywhere near my parents. Don't touch them. Okay. Scott, let's go. Scott and I took off. We tried the garage door. And it was unlocked. So looking through the garage, I chose upon a crowbar. I saw Richard Wendorf asleep on the couch. We traveled in to the back bedrooms as swiftly as we could. They're creeping through the house. He yanks the phone out of the wall so they can't call. We came back out into the living room area proper where Richard was asleep. And the dad turns and sees him. Then they hear that Heather's mother, she comes out of the bedroom and he just starts beating on her with this tire iron. Rod Farrell and his sidekick Scott have attacked Heather's parents and stolen their car. I wiped the blood from my face, my arms, my chest. I took my clothes off and burnt them. Rod has got his sight set on the Windorf's SUV. It's a newer vehicle, it's a nice vehicle. So they take the SUV and then they, they go down the road. Ignorant of what has happened, Heather and the rest of the vampire clan wait for him. Flash your eye beams. Heather sees her dad's SUV. Her first reaction is, my parents are looking for me. Rod signals for Heather, Charity, and Dana to follow in the other car. Heather realizes Scott and Rod in the car. Then she's saying out loud, she says, well, how did they get the car? How did they get the car? I don't understand. How did they get the car? She doesn't understand. The convoy heads out for New Orleans. Meantime, Heather's 17-year-old sister returns home from a night out. Jennifer walks into a brutal murder scene where you see your father bludgeoned about the head. Blood, brain matter. Mom laying dead. None of us, I think, would ever want to walk in and see what she saw. She's on the 911 call. She says, my parents are dead. Okay, we're on the way. 
They're trying to calm her down and stay on the line. An officer's coming your way. And the officer goes in. He's got his handgun out. He's checking the rooms to make sure there's nobody inside. My dad's car is missing. The Eustis Police Department were thinking it must be some kind of home invasion type of robbery. We got two people dead brutally. And my God, you know, where in the world is Heather? While the police question Jennifer for leads, her sister Heather is in a car with Charity and Dana. Following Rod and Scott in her parents' stolen SUV. Heather has no idea her mom and dad lie dead in their living room. A few hours into their journey, Rod decides to break into a house. Rod burglarizes a house and steals a shotgun. Tyler. And he took Heather aside and explained to her in great detail what had happened, how it all evolved, how he killed her parents. I was like, I, I'm your parent now. Heather was terrified. Rod gets them to swap license plates. They're all going to travel in the stolen SUV. Come on. So we all traveled together in one pack. Let's go. And we took off for New Orleans. They kept that tire iron in the car under the seat near where she sat. I think it's kind of an intimidation thing. Back at the Wendorf house, the police are putting the pieces together. I want everyone get along home. Jennifer's telling them a little bit about Rod. Uh, she's got this friend, his name is Rod. And he's into kind of a vampire stuff. And then they're really getting alarmed now. The police now suspect Rod Farrell of the murders based on Jennifer's information. And then they're making calls up to Kentucky to the police up there to find out what they're dealing with. And the, one of the police officers up there says, you've got a really wild bunch on the loose now. Vampire killers are running wild and the police have no idea where they are. They put out a bolo, what they call a bolo, it's to be on the lookout for. The FBI was involved. They had police agencies all along the Gulf Coast that were involved. News is breaking of a double murder which took place in the Eustis area last night. Details are sketchy, but we believe the police are seeking a group of teenagers. We will give you more details as soon as we have them. Back in Murray, Kentucky, Rod's mother gets news of the murder of Heather's parents. They said Rod killed two people. It was total shock. There's no really emotions. There's nothing really that you can say as a parent, as a mother, when you hear that kind of news. Folks are worried that the teenagers are driving back to Kentucky to continue their bloodthirsty rampage. I mean, the cops were on high alert, thinking Rob was gonna come back and, and go on this mass killing spree. However, the fugitive teens aren't heading north, but west for New Orleans. Rod had that shotgun on his lap and said, if any cops try to arrest us, I'll blast them. 
He's killed already. He's going to kill some more. After three days on the run, Rod's band of teen vampires are beginning to lose faith in their leader. Rod is struggling in some ways to have them believe, you know, I'm this immortal soul and I, I'm your leader. And, uh, and, and there's kind of a dichotomy in the way that you see the kids react and feel. I think they, that veneer is shot for them. Even to them, he has crossed the line. This isn't romantic. Is it just wrong? And we're scared and we're hungry and we're running. The reality didn't live up to the hype. When we reached Baton Rouge, we were virtually on the last legs of the money we had. Charity believed that she could get money on a wire from her mother. Charity calls her mother, who is a corrections officer in South Dakota. Mom says, look, I'll, I'll wire some money to this motel. Well, of course, she tips the police officers off in Baton Rouge. It was uh, November 28th, 1996, when we received information off the double murder. The suspects had apparently been traced to our city, so we put the word out to all of our patrol people to, to be on the lookout. Despite his better judgment, Rod agrees to collect the money supposedly wired by Charity's mom. We had to go to some hotel of some sort to pick up the money. And I told her, I said, this is a trap. I was like, once we go there, there will be cops everywhere. No, 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 my, my mom wouldn't do that. I mean, she's already wired us the money, okay? So, we get to the hotel. I looked across behind the hotel. And I thought in that moment, I was like, I could leave right now. I could run. This is the last chance I have to run. If not, I will probably die. We were dealing with violent suspects who had committed a double murder. And so you take every precaution as a law enforcement officer when dealing with those type suspects. Surely enough, as I believed, <laughs> mere moments later, there were numerous police all getting out and all drawing their weapons and all telling me to freeze and don't move. Those traveling with me were worried that I would take drastic measures. They saw that I had reached the point of no return. If I die, so be it. You are surrounded by armed officers. All of these people ranked up against me, weapons drawn and ready to use them. They didn't realize how much I just had given up, how much I didn't care. Rod's teenage bravado is short-lived. I thought to myself, I'm a up, mentally deranged teenager who's about to lose his entire life. And the only thing I might be able to do is save these other idiots who have followed me. There was no attempt to run uh, or offer any resistance, and they were taken into custody and detained at that point. I remember looking at them and thinking, they're not vampires, and they're not even a cult. They're just a bunch of young kids trying to find their way. They've latched on to this guy, Rod Farrell. The Wendorfs had lost their lives, and now all these kids had really thrown their lives away as well. 
Despite their arrest, Rod's followers are still under his spell. I think with all of them, there was something that none of us as lawyers had seen before. You know, you followed this guy, and he's got you here in the county jail. But there was still this aura of not wanting to hurt Rod. Most of the time I saw them, they just seemed beaten down. Uh, very tired, lost kids. Uh, you know, I actually felt sorry for a couple of them looking at them because they, they clearly appeared to be kids with no sense of direction who had gotten involved in something that they had not thought through the consequences of and, and now we're gonna have to deal with those consequences for the rest of their lives. Rod was a big fan of Rod. You could tell that he uh, was the type of person who thought very highly of himself. Even though he would throw off these lines about he didn't care about life and he didn't care about himself, you could tell that, that he did care about himself and the world centered around him. For investigators, the Klan's reluctance to talk doesn't much matter. Rod decides to come clean. Hey, I want to make a statement. I told him, I need to be able to tell you what happened. And that's what led to the confessions, the infamous confessions. Heather's mother was in the shower, and her father was watching TV. And I lost it. It came in flashes. I remember striking him as hard as I could. And I just kept striking him. I just got boom, right across the temple of the head. It knocked him cold. Rod said, I got a rush out of it. I got a rush out of killing him. The next thing I remember is Scott staring at me with his eyes wide. He was in shock. Then they hear that Heather's mother, and she says, what are you doing here? What, what do you want? And again, I lost myself in that red haze. He just starts beating on her with this tire iron and just keeps on beating her until her brain stem is exposed. There's pieces of skull everywhere. I just kept beating him and beating him and beating him and beating him, taking pleasure in it at that. Rod thought that if you take somebody's life, you become like a god. He just reveled in it. Armed with Rod's confession, the cops indict his followers. Under Florida law, complicity to commit murder is the same as committing murder. Dana Cooper, Charity Cassie, Scott Anderson, and Rod Farrell were all charged with first-degree murder. Heather was appointed an attorney to represent her, and he actually took her in front of the grand jury. The grand jury, after listening to her statement, decided that they did not want to charge her with any offenses, so she was released. Heather Wendorf is cleared of all charges. There were a lot of people who felt that Heather should have been prosecuted. She and Rod had been having conversations about how miserable she was. And Rod, in his mind, felt he was the only person who could come and help her. The brutal murder of the Wendorfs shocked the nation. Charity Kesey received a sentence of 10 and a half years. Dana Cooper received a sentence of 17 and a half years. Scott Anderson received a life sentence. Rod's trial for double murder opens on February 2nd, 1998 in Florida. 
Rod pled guilty for the crimes that he was charged with. The jury came back with a 12-0 verdict, recommending that Rod be put to death. <laughs> That's something I've thought about for many years. How, as a child, because really that's all it was. For everything I was doing, for everything I thought that I knew, I was an idiot child. I was a 16-year-old boy who thought he knew more than he really did. And it's made me think, if I had just done anything else, if I had just... They did uh, show the film of his confession. So I just beat him until he died. And it didn't take them long yeah. at all to make their decision to send a 16-year-old to death row. Did you strike him anywhere else with the crowbar or just in the head? I striked him once in the chest because he wouldn't stop breathing, so I stabbed him in the heart. I took the straight end of the crowbar and just started bashing the back of her head. I believe at that time he was the youngest person on death row. When they pronounced the death sentence, I said, I accept it. I accept it for what it is. I just evidently will die younger than I had expected. Rod's sentence was eventually commuted to life imprisonment. He is still behind bars and will never be released. Um, <clears throat> anyway, that's what happened that night. It is a case that changed this community. Uh, it changed the way that we looked at each other. And it changed the way that we looked at our kids. We lost our small town feel during that case.